The Passion Translation has sold millions of copies and is recommended by some big names in the evangelical world. I think it needs to be addressed because there are some slippery, sneaky things going on behind it that many people may not know how to deal with. This is an episode on how Bible translation can go horribly wrong and make someone a boatload of money at the same time. It's the story of how spiritual language, the supernatural, and sophomoric talk about the biblical languages can impress a lot of people. To some of you, this may be a terrifying episode, but we live in a world where crazy stuff happens all the time. I'm Andrew Case, and you're listening to Working for the Word. Here goes nothing. Now, please believe me when I say that I hesitated a lot to address the Passion Translation. It's not easy, and I take no delight in it, to be honest. Now, to begin our discussion, let's take a while to listen to the one man behind it all, Brian Simmons. He'll tell the story of how the translation came to be in his own words. So I want to be fair to him to take some time to listen to him in his own words describe this. This will serve to frame our analysis of what he's published so far and evaluate some of what he's claiming. So here we go. Brian Simmons gets a new assignment. What happened? Jesus Christ came into my room. He breathed on me, and he commissioned me, and he spoke to me and said, and I'm commissioning you to translate, to translate the Bible, the Bible into the into translation, the, the project, translation that project that I'm giving you to do. And, I and he promised that he would help me, and he promised me he would give me secrets of the Hebrew language. Do you believe when he blew on you there was an impartation for revelation? I do. I believe the spirit of revelation was given. And I have to say, when he breathed on me, in no way would I want to compare that to the uh, writers of the New Testament, the original writers. Uh, you know, Moses and the Torah and Ezekiel. He breathed on me so that I would do the project, and I felt downloads coming instantly. I received downloads. It was like I got a chip put inside of me. I got a connection inside of me to hear him better, to understand the scriptures better, and hopefully to translate. Are you finding that when people read uh, the translation you're working on, that it almost does a mind bypass and goes directly into the heart? I think that's a brilliant way to say it. The poetic language of Hebrew and Aramaic release something inside of us. It, it's, it's divine. It is full of revelation. There's flavor. It, it's, not, it's like thinking with your heart. It's like heart level to heart level. Spirit to spirit, deep calling out to deep. Passion is the operative word. This translation will give you that passion back. When we come back, I'm going to talk. As a matter of fact, Brian told me that he had a word. I believe it's going to release some miracles. We also, I've got to find out about that library. Are you interested? I know you are. Are you? We'll be right back to It's Supernatural. Call now and get the powerful new Passion Translation Bible box set, which includes 15 of Brian Simmons' favorite books of the Bible in eight easy-to-carry volumes. Included is this brand-new Passion Translation of the Gospel of Matthew, available only through this TV offer for a limited time. Normally, you'd pay $120 for this box set, but through this exclusive offer for It's Supernatural, you can get it for a gift of only $89. That's a savings of $31. Include shipping and handling. Ask for offer number one. 1875. The romantic, poetic, heart filled words of God will fill you with new passion and God's revival fire. You will get to know God on a deeper and more intimate level. The very words in this translation will go right past the defenses in your mind and right into your spirit. The Word of God will become so alive in you, and you will have a supernatural encounter with the glory and presence of God. 
you will get eight volumes which include 15 books of the Bible, including the Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Songs, John, Matthew, Luke and Acts, Hebrews and James, and Letters from Heaven. You know, Brian Simmons was telling me at dinner last night about some revelations he got in translating the Bible about women. Tell me one. Well, there is a well-worn verse in the Bibles of many men that have used this verse and have hurt people uh, because of possibly a mistranslation. And it's Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husband as unto the Lord. That is That's a pretty powerful. Da- daunting uh, command. But the Aramaic language, again, Jesus spoke in Aramaic. He taught in Aramaic. The apostles taught in Aramaic as well. The Aramaic text is wives be tenderly devoted to your husband as the church is tenderly devoted to Christ. Big difference. Okay. How in the world did you get into the library room of heaven? I want to go there. Well, you know, as believers in Christ, there's only one entrance into the realm of the Spirit, and that is the name of Yeshua, the name of Jesus Christ. It's, we don't work it up. We don't get into an ecstatic state on our own. I was actually asleep, and I was taken out of my body, and I was brought into this immense library room, I loved being there, and the Lord came up to me, and He said, Brian, I have brought you here here to let you take any two two books books you want. want. And I'm just walking around, but it didn't take long before I saw a book that I knew I was to have, and then soon I saw another book I knew I was to have. But uh, you'll never want me back on the show when I tell you what happened then. What? Well, I have to tell you the truth. I saw a third book, and I knew the Lord told me I could only take two. And in heaven, whatever you think is put out over the loudspeaker. Everyone hears it. (laughs) Your thoughts are broadcasted. So here's what I hear coming out of the loudspeaker, and it's my own thoughts. How can I steal this book? (laughs) And then I said, oh, no, I'm shoplifting on God. I felt so ashamed that I, but I knew if I could take this book, there was this book so, if I could just take this book back with me to the natural realm, it would trigger awakening in all the nations of the earth. It would bring the, it would make the name of Jesus famous on the, in the world. But Jesus came to me and said, Brian, I cannot let you take this book. And he looked at me in the eyes with love that melted me. And he said, you are not ready for that book. Then he promised, but, but I will bring, bring you back, back one day, day and, I will give you and I will give you that book. What was the title? Written on the cover of the book was John 22. Uh, but there's only 21 chapters in John. What's this 22? Well, John 22, go back to John 14, 12, and you'll see that there is a greater works generation. The works that I do, you will do even greater works than these. I believe the John 22 generation will be a people that do the greater works of Jesus. They will not add to the scripture, and and that's a sealed book, but it is a book that is unfolding, and the works of Jesus will be replicated by an entire generation of people that believe fully in the power of God. He came again. It was in a dream. He came and touched my forehead right here, right here, and said, I'm increasing your capacity to know me. And then I woke up. We ended up with the top brain mapping person in the world. I asked her, if God touched you right here at the hairline, right there, what, what would that do to your brain? And she said, no, you don't understand. It would enlarge the capacity. The Spirit of the Lord came upon me. I told you I had a visitation from the one I love. He walked through my wall and breathed on me and released me to do this translation project. And he breathed on me and he promised me that that he would give me help and give me secrets of the Hebrew language, secrets of the Bible. Secrets that only come from above. I discovered and uncovered so many mysteries and glory realms. And uh, that was the beginning of the Passion Translation Project. 90% 
of the biblical problems you have with understanding the text of the Bible, 90% of them disappear with the Aramaic text. Now, when Jesus came to me, one of the secrets he gave me was that of homonyms. The Lord showed me it's the homonymic uh, structure of Hebrew is going to be the key to understanding Revelation in the last days, including the book of Revelation, which you haven't got yet, honestly. He has embedded into the scriptures such profound revelation on multiple layers and multiple levels. In other words, every word God spoke and is written in the scriptures can have multiple meanings. I call it God's entertainment. I think he laughs when we read the Bible and say, oh, you think that's all it means? <laughs> God really helped me with this translation, with Romans in particular. I'm mega understating it. God really helped me do this translation. Romans is a hard book. I didn't even get through the first chapter. I'm saying, God, you got to help me. Two in the morning, I'm literally shaken awake by an angel. He says, I've come for the presence of God to help you. You might want to read Romans. Uh, I had such help. First of all, let me just say that if you made it through that entire segment so far, you're brave. And I should warn you strongly against watching the actual video of his appearance on the show It's Supernatural because of how utterly, absolutely cringeworthy it is. They dramatized his stories with terrible actors, including someone who plays Jesus with very long hair and looks like he's either stoned or constipated or both. It's very disturbing and blasphemous in my mind. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to evaluate his claims and take a detailed look at his actual translation. First, Brian Simmons claims that Jesus himself commissioned the translation. This is awkward. This is really awkward because it puts us all in the position that many girls have been put into by men who told them that God supernaturally revealed to them that they were going to be their wife. So how's a girl supposed to respond to this? So if this happens, and I believe this can happen because this happened to my dad, he heard God's audible voice telling him he was going to marry my mom, but my dad didn't go up immediately to my mom and reveal this to her because he was wise and he knew that wouldn't be a good idea. The best idea is to wait, keep that to yourself, and then wait to see if God's word comes true and see the fruit of that, etc., right? But if you do that to a girl and then she breaks up with you, then she's thwarting the will of God and sinning, right? And it's even worse because in hyper-charismatic circles, to question such a revelation would be to quench the spirit, or worse. And if you question such a revelation coming from a man like Brian Simmons, who claims to be an apostle, then you'd be opposing God's anointed one, as they'd say in hyper-charismatic circles. And that is one of the worst things you can do. You could bring a curse on yourself. So it puts all of us in an awkward position, including Jesus himself, by saying this. Because if you don't immediately go out and buy this translation, you must not be a dedicated follower of Jesus who commissioned this translation. You must not believe in the supernatural. And if you buy the translation and don't like it, and don't recommend it, then you should feel bad. Because, for crying out loud, it's a translation commissioned directly by the Son of God. What's wrong with you? You don't like translations inspired by God himself? Now, you may say, well, the prophets validated their messages by telling of supernatural encounters they had, like Isaiah 6 and the beginning of Ezekiel. So why can't Brian Simmons do that? Well, here's the big problem for me. The prophets of old were never telling you about their experiences in order to sell you something. They had no product. They only had a message of repentance, destruction, and hope. They were holding people accountable to the covenant. They were not stamping a big, giant, copyright, all rights reserved notice on their message and then charging people money for it. So if Brian were completely giving his translation away as a public domain or creative commons work, he might be slightly more believable to me. 
but apparently Jesus forgot to mention that part in his commission to him. The other problem with making these supernatural claims is that it raises very, very high expectations in those who are going to read his translation. If Jesus himself commissioned your translation and you received secrets and downloads and superhuman mental capacity from heaven and got special help from an angel of God who appeared to you, then your translation better be astonishingly, dazzlingly, perfectly brilliant. It better be on another level that basically makes the NIV look like child's play. Isn't that a fair expectation? But as we'll see, this translation has all of the same kinds of imperfections, biases that any translation has, along with a ton of extra confusion and doubtful decisions that many translations don't have. So next, let's talk about Brian's claim about the secrets of the Hebrew language. He claims that Hebrew is a language of homonyms. Two words are homonyms if they are pronounced or spelled the same way, but have different meanings. So, He's claiming that the Bible is full of lots of double meanings that we've missed because Jesus revealed to him this secret of the Hebrew language. Now, this has not been a secret of the Hebrew language ever, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, It has not been a secret of any language. All languages that I'm aware of have homonyms, and they have the possibility of doing this. Now, what I'm interested in is, does he treat this correctly, and honestly. So let's look at Psalm 23. Psalm 23, something we all are familiar with. The first verse, as we all know it, is the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Okay, a very traditional rendering. This is what he has. Yahweh is my best friend and my shepherd. I always have more than enough. So you may be wondering, okay, where does he get this best friend idea? Now, he has a footnote. The footnote says, and this is on the word shepherd, the word most commonly used for shepherd is taken from the root ra'ah, which is also the Hebrew word for best friend. This translation includes both meanings. Okay, so that might be interesting for an opinion piece or a commentary, but is it okay for a translation? Let's look at the BDB lexicon for the verb ra'ah that this is based on. Here in Psalm 23, it's a cal participle for those of you who know Hebrew. The lexicon lists the first meaning as to pasture or tend. And the second most common meaning is figurative of God as shepherd. And the third most common use is for a ruler or rulers such as in Ezekiel 34, 2, we have, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. So my first question is, why didn't Brian choose to communicate the meaning of ruler into his translation? Now, what he says about the word ra'ah, also having the meaning of friend, is true. But it is listed as a separate entry for a separate word, that's spelled the same. Just like bank of a river and bank as a financial institution would not be listed under the same entry in English. We have only one example, actually, where it's translated as friend in Judges 14.20. ESV says, And Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best man, Re'ah, The NASB and KJV simply translate best man as friend, and the NIV turns it into a phrase, who had attended him at the feast. So this whole issue is rather slippery, and I think that people like Brian Simmons count on the fact that most people won't know how to deal with it or simply won't bother to dig deep enough to figure out what's going on underneath. Is it really valid to take every single meaning or some of the meanings of a word and double or triple translate them 
as though the author had intended all of those meanings at once. All right. I, as an author, know what it's like to be misinterpreted this way. And it can happen. I actually had a very strange experience once when I shared some fiction writing that I had done with somebody who tried to read all of these double meanings into it that I had never intended. And it was quite a bizarre experience. Now, I say this is slippery because there certainly is a lot of wordplay in the Bible, okay? We all acknowledge that. The Bible uses wordplay like everyone else does, and that is not unique to Hebrew. It is not a secret of the Hebrew language to know that it has wordplay. But that is different from reading double or triple meanings from a homonym. Usually an author intends a single meaning by a word, whether that's in poetry or prose. Okay? This is entering into the field of cognitive linguistics, which is an interdisciplinary approach to the study of language, mind, and sociocultural experience that first emerged in the 1970s. So let's take poetry for an example. Because poetry is where you would expect this thing to happen the most if you're going to have double meanings like Brian Simmons talks about with homonyms, right? So we want to be careful to compare the same kind of genre to what he's doing in Psalm 23, which is poetry. So here's the beginning of one of my favorite poems called Maidenhood by Henry W. Longfellow. Maiden with the meek brown eyes in whose orbs a shadow lies like the dusk of evening skies. Thou whose locks outshine the sun, golden tresses wreathed in one as the braided streamlets run. Standing with reluctant feet where the brook and river meet, womanhood and childhood fleet. So let's zoom in on this line where he says, Thou whose locks outshine the sun. Okay. Well, if we're doing what Brian Simmons is doing, we can say locks. Okay, in English, we have locks of hair, but we also have locks like padlocks, right? So Longfellow obviously meant for us to translate this English into whatever other language we're translating it into by putting locks of hair and also translating locks as far as lock on a door, right? Wrong. Then we have outshine the sun, whose locks outshine the sun. Okay, sun, sun in English. Oh, it's a homonym because it sounds like sun, like son of God. Okay, so we have to assume that Longfellow was meaning both of those things when he wrote this. So we have to figure out how sun and sun are related. So we could probably actually translate this as Jesus. So thou whose locks outshine Jesus would be a very valid translation into another language of this because Jesus is the son of God and he shines like the sun, and so that would communicate the original meaning of this English poem if we translated it that way. So if you think this sounds too ridiculous, like I'm not being fair and I'm building a straw man, I would just challenge you to figure out and point to exactly how I'm doing that, because I'd be interested to know how this is being unfair to what Brian Simmons has done in this translation. Okay, so let's keep going with Longfellow. He says, standing with reluctant feet. Okay, feet. Feet has two meanings in English, right? Feet, what I walk with, and then feet, what I measure with. And so Longfellow probably meant both of those, so I should translate into Spanish or whatever, both of those meaning somehow. Then 
where the brook and river meet. Hmm, meet. Meet has two meanings in English, right? Meet, M-E-E-T, sounds exactly like M-E-A-T. Oh, wow. So what he must have been saying is that where the brook and river meet is also where you might find some meat. And if I think long enough, I can relate that somehow to maidenhood. Now, if I were Longfellow, I would be appalled at somebody translating my poem that way. It would not be helpful. It would not reveal any secret meanings. And it would not help people get a transparent idea of what the author wanted you to understand. Now, to bring this home even more, here's another example of how this chaos of homonyms would play out in English if we took Brian's model of interpretation and translation. Let's imagine that someone wrote Brian the following letter, okay? So I'll read it first and then we'll analyze it. Dear Brian, have you heard? Yesterday I read that the Russian ruler made and declared a mandate that bats can no longer be sold to miners. Okay, so let's analyze this letter. Dear Brian, dear, okay, dear is a homonym because I have dear, D-E-A-R, but I also have dear, the animal. So he must be calling Brian or referring to Brian as this kind of animal. Then it says, have you heard? Okay, heard is a homonym. Heard, H-E-A-R-D, is also H-E-R-D. They're pronounced exactly the same. They sound exactly the same. Have you heard? So this probably relates to deer, where he's calling Brian a deer. And so deer move in herds. And so we could think more about that, but let's move on. Yesterday, I read, okay, read, read. Oh, read sounds exactly like red. It's a homonym, another homonym. Read the color. So the letter must have been, or the announcement must have been read or Since it says Russian ruler, Russian, we usually represent them with red. And so this is making a connection with Russian. Okay, okay. We're we're getting the deeper meaning here. The Russian ruler. Okay, Russian, Russian. Russian, okay, it has a homonym also. Russian, like I'm Russian to the store. Like I'm Russian to school because I'm late. Okay, so that must mean that there was some urgency to this mandate. Okay, the ruler, the Russian ruler. Oh, ruler. Ruler is also a homonym. Ruler also means something you measure with. And so, hmm, maybe this has to do with some kind of measurement or that he's measuring, he's, he doesn't measure up. Hmm, we'll see. Let's keep going. Made, so the Russian ruler made and declared a mandate. Okay, so made, made, made. Oh, made also is a homonym because it sounds exactly like made, you know, like somebody who is a young girl. And uh, so maybe this has to do with young girls somehow. And declared a mandate. Okay, we won't go into analyzing the word declare, but there could be some interesting stuff in there. Mandate. Okay, mandate, mandate. Okay, if we take that apart, mandate, man plus date. Okay, so date has three meanings as well. So we could have a date that you eat. You could have a date on the calendar. You could have a date with a woman. Okay, so okay, so that might be something that's part of this meaning in this letter. And then the mandate is that bats can no longer be sold to minors. Hmm. Bats are also things that fly and things that you hit a baseball with. So which one does he mean? We probably should translate both, right? And miners, huh? The miners that go down and and dig gold out of the ground um, or miners who are underage, it must mean both. So let's translate both somehow. If we translate this letter, whew, exhausting. Absolutely exhausting. So I think you get my point. You get my point. It's a little bit of a parody, but 
I hope it helps make the point. Now, for those of you who want to go deeper into this issue, there's an article that I'll link in the description on polysemy and homonymy in biblical Hebrew. Now, in this article, the author points out that there is wordplay. Okay, so we were talking about wordplay. There is wordplay in Proverbs 30, verse 33. Let me read it in Hebrew first and listen for the word meets. Okay, for the repetition of this word. Ki meets halav yotzi chema, u meets af yotzi dam, u meets apayim yotzi riv. So if you look up meets in a lexicon, it's actually a very rare word, and it means squeezing or pressing. So the NRSV tried to bring this out transparently in English, even though it wasn't extremely natural. So it reads, For as pressing milk produces curds, and pressing the nose produces blood, so pressing anger produces strife. Okay? Now the NIV went for naturalness over communicating this whole wordplay. So it says, For as churning the milk produces butter, and twisting the nose produces blood, so stirring up anger produces strife. Used three different words, but it's still a good translation because they are somewhat similar. Churning, twisting, stirring, right? Now, if Brian Simmons is so concerned about the secrets of Hebrew and bringing out these kinds of wordplays or homonyms, Let's see what he did with this translation. His translation says, For such stupidity may give you a bloody nose. Stirring up an argument only leads to an angry confrontation. Okay. So his translation actually obscures the wordplay more than most. And he doesn't include a footnote alerting the audience to the wordplay. So it's interesting that he doesn't bring out valid and obvious wordplay, but then plays fast and loose with what I would call homonym fallacies. Now let's keep going with Psalm 23. Here it is in the ESV, verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Here it is in the Passion Translation. You become my delicious feast, even when my enemies dare to fight. You anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. You give me all I can drink of you until my cup overflows. Now, this is where some of his true colors show, because you can see his extreme bias from his hypercharismatic background, which we will get into later. So, first of all, I see the difference that when he says, you become my delicious feast, he's obviously making a jump from you prepare a table before me to some kind of metaphorical or metonymous interpretation here. Then he says, you anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. Now, here he has a footnote which says, or you anoint my head with oil. Oil or fragrance becomes a symbol of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but that is what I would call an unduly free translation where you are assuming symbolism where you do not have the right as a translator to assume that symbolism. Then he says in another footnote on the word overflows until my cup overflows, he says, or your cup cheers me like the best wine. And right after that, in parentheses, he has LXX and then or my chalice that inebriates me, how goodly it is, in parentheses, vulgate. Now, my critique of this is, first, Brian is obviously trying to create a translation that he says is going to go straight to your heart and is not created for highfalutin academics. In order for him to be consistent with that purpose, he should not be using abbreviations like LXX in his Bible. Why? 
because most people don't know, the average reader does not know that LXX refers to the Septuagint. That's just confusing to the average reader. No other translation that I know of actually does this in their footnote if they're trying to reach normal people. So ESV, for instance, will just write out Septuagint. If there's a textual variant that's important, they'll just put that there written out, not LXX. So my honest hunch is that this is an academic veneer that gives the average reader the impression that, oh, I can trust this because it uses abbreviations that I don't understand. So this guy must be smart, so I can trust this. The other thing that bothers me about this verse is that nothing is in italics. He could have done that. So part of his translation philosophy is when something isn't in the original text that I need to put in there for the sake of making it more natural or understandable, then I put that in italics. So that's what he has committed himself to do. And he does this on occasion as you look through the translation. But nothing in this verse is in italics, not even the part about the Holy Spirit. Even though Holy Spirit is not in the Hebrew, so it should be in italics if he were being consistent with his own statement. At the end of the day, this is a clear example of imposing your theology onto the text of Scripture instead of letting Scripture evaluate your theology. Another example of this comes in the well-known passage of the Lord's Prayer. So let's check this out together. Here's what the Passion Translation says. Our beloved Father, dwelling in the heavenly realms, may the glory of your name be the center on which our lives turn. Manifest your kingdom realm and cause your every purpose to be fulfilled on earth, just as it is in heaven. So first of all, our beloved Father, it says. In Greek, it simply says, our Father who is in heaven. So first of all, you'd expect something to be in italics here, but it is not. So beloved is added, and then he says heavenly realms. And then in verse 10, he says, manifest your kingdom realm. Now, why is this necessary? to say realm or realms. Well, this is actually something that is a catchword in the hypercharismatic movement. It's a very popular word to use, and you can look up other catchwords in the charismatic movement that have high word counts if you do a search in the Passion Translation. Most English translations rarely, if ever, use the word realm. But here again, we see the influence of his constituency and his background, his denominational or sectarian bent being imposed upon the translation without giving any warning to the reader. No italics, no footnote. Adding the word beloved here isn't wrong. It's not bad to call God beloved. Absolutely not. But it gives the feeling that there is an element of sentimentalizing the translation of God's word going on with Brian's translation. Because it's called the Passion Translation, you've got to inject a little more oomph of emotional language into the translation. And let me just say for the record, God's word is already cool and awesome enough. It does not need us to tamper with it to make it more cool or more emotionally appealing. Now, on the Passion Translation website, it says, Throughout history, many Bible translations have been tied to particular traditions or denominations. The Passion Translation, however, is not rooted in any one tradition or denomination, but desires to help the wider body of Christ encounter the heart of God anew in the language of today. I would say a closer look would reveal the contrary. To me, this is obviously a sectarian translation that is meant to fit and justify the theology of the neo-charismatic movement. I think it would be more honest if they just said that straight out. But of course, that would not help it sell more copies. The website also says this. 
The Passion Translation is an excellent translation you can use as your primary text to seriously study God's Word because it combines the best aspects of what is called formal and functional equivalence Bibles. It is a balanced translation that tries to hold both the word's literal meaning and original message in proper tension, resulting in an entirely new, fresh, fiery translation of God's word. Furthermore, this is the first modern English translation to use Aramaic, the language of Jesus and the disciples, as a lens through which to view God's original word to us a word of truth and love. This translation philosophy will benefit your serious study of Scripture in several ways. The text was interpreted from the original language, carrying its original meaning and giving you an accurate, reliable expression of God's original message. I disagree with that. The meaning of a passage takes priority over the form of the original words so that every English speaker can encounter the heart of God through his word in a way that's natural and readable, except for those who don't understand what LXX means. (laughs) Next, this translation keeps the Bible in step with changes in modern English helping you clearly understand God's original message and how it applies to your life in the 21st century. I would also disagree with the naturalness and modernness of his English. If you read more of it for yourself, you can see that. Then it goes on. This translation reclaims lost Aramaic texts, bringing the full texture of God's word to the surface and helping you recapture the original essence of the teachings of Jesus and his disciples. Just a quick comment here. There really are no lost Aramaic texts. And if there are, he does not reveal what those are. It seems to me that it would be really important to reference these with exactitude on the website so that people can go look at them for themselves and see exactly what he's talking about. But instead, they only say reclaims lost Aramaic text to give this veneer of mystery and intrigue so that people will go out and buy the translation. Then he goes on, this version taps into the love language of God letting the words of scripture go through the human soul, past the defenses of our mind and into our spirit. Countless people have told us how the Passion Translation has helped them freshly discover intimacy with Christ in their journey through scripture and that it has rapidly become their translation of choice for Bible study. We are thrilled to offer this accurate, faithful, clear, and readable translation for your serious study of God's Word, and look forward to hearing how it helps you encounter the heart of God anew. Okay, so I don't need to comment a lot on this because I think you can judge for yourself whether these are really accurate claims. I will say it is interesting that they say it taps into the love language of God. I have no idea what that means. I would love to find out what that is. (laughs) But it sounds great for marketing. Now, more about this Aramaic business. One of the most confusing things about this translation is that Brian Simmons has totally caught off guard the average Bible reader by his appeal to the Aramaic translation of the New Testament. He capitalizes on the mysterious origins of the Syriac Peshitta and claims that the New Testament was probably originally written in Aramaic and thus the Syriac Peshitta must be closer to the original since Syriac is closely related to Aramaic. Okay, this is what I'm assuming he is communicating because I've heard other people talk about this before. So whenever the Syriac conveniently provides something, that will tickle the reader's ears or give something novel enough to make it more marketable, then he goes with the Syriac, which he always calls Aramaic for some reason. So he exaggerates the fringe idea that Aramaic was the original language of the New Testament, which the majority of scholars reject to this day. The consensus within biblical scholarship although not universal, is that the Old Testament 
of the Peshitta was translated into Syriac from biblical Hebrew, probably in the second century AD, and that the New Testament of the Peshitta was translated from the Greek. This New Testament originally excluded certain disputed books like Second Peter or Jude or Revelation, and it had become a standard by the early 5th century. The five excluded books were added later in 616 AD. So, as to why we can't put too much stock in the Peshitta version of the New Testament is really beyond the scope of this episode. But I'll link in the description an article that walks you through the problems of the quote-unquote Peshitta primacy theory, which is actually an old idea. Now, let's look at one more verse. And just so you know, I'm not cherry-picking here. You can read the Passion Translation online on Bible Gateway or version for yourself and do your own analysis of a thousand other verses. Easily, this could go on for hours and hours. So let's look at Ephesians 5, 21 through 22. This is what a normal translation would say. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Okay, now let's check out the Passion Translation. And you already heard what he said about it in his interview, right? So here's what he says. And out of your reverence for Christ, be supportive of each other in love. Supportive. For wives, this means being devoted to your husbands like you are tenderly devoted to our Lord. Okay. There is nothing in italics, first of all. Second of all, it has a footnote on devoted. Okay. For wives, this means being devoted. Footnote says... The Greek word for submit or supportive is not found in verse 22. It is literally wives with your husbands. Okay, why is that? First of all, that is not a mystery. It is simply because the imperative be subject to or submit to is being understood from verse 21 right before it. And this is a common occurrence with Greek. Second of all, I think this is dangerous because the way the footnote is worded, it seems to intentionally create doubt in the average reader's mind as to the validity of all other translations that translate this as wives submit to your husbands by saying the Greek word for submit is not found there, and not explaining why they would translate it that way. So it implies by its wording and brevity that these other translations are actually fooling you, and they're inserting words into the Bible to perhaps enslave women. Now, the other problem I have with this is that there's no way for us to know that he has supposedly chosen to translate what it says in the Peshitta here. The footnote says nothing about the Aramaic or Peshitta. He claims in the interview that you heard that he found this in the Aramaic, quote unquote. So that would be the only way you would know this. So my curiosity led me to look this up in the Aramaic. Does the Peshitta really say that in Syriac? You can easily look up multiple English translations of the Peshitta online and compare them. Okay? I'll link a place to do that in the description. Here are three English renderings of Ephesians 5.22 in the Peshitta. Here we go. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to our Lord. Wives, be ye submissive to your husbands as to our Lord. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as to our Lord. So what in the world is happening? Is he lying or just being sloppy? Is he desperately wanting this hard teaching to go away? I don't think most people like this passage, to be honest. Okay? It tells women to submit to their husbands, and it tells husbands to give up their very lives for their wives. It's super hard 
on both sexes, not just on women. So we all struggle with different passages of the Bible. But the answer is never to create a translation that makes them go away with zero basis besides our own modern cultural bias. If you want to go deeper into some of the issues with this translation, there's a YouTuber named Mike Winger who has dedicated a lot of time to interviewing scholars about the translation. I don't agree with some things he has to say, but you can check him out. And there is also a long article review on the Gospel Coalition, which I'll link in the description. At the end of the day, the solution is not to simply call this a paraphrase, even though the author doesn't. This won't solve anything for anyone and isn't technically accurate. And I don't think it's valid to criticize the translation because it's done by one man, as some people have been doing. God can make amazing translations with one man, like Luther's or Tyndale's. And it's not enough to merely ignore it because it has become mainstream and it's selling millions of copies. We need to help people think clearly about what is going on. This, by the way, is another reason to make learning the biblical languages the new normal for Christian discipleship. You probably know this is my soapbox by now, but we've got to get the average Christian to learn Greek and Hebrew. It is not impossible. It's just hard. And now my wife and I are trying our best to make it available even for children. You know, the problem has not been that it's impossible for people to learn a language. People learn languages all the time. They learn languages constantly. It just hasn't been taught the right way so that people can actually learn it in a natural way that they're designed to learn language. And now there's absolutely no excuse not to learn Hebrew. If you're a child, if you're 65, if you're a stay-at-home mom or whoever, you can go to freehebrew.online and it costs nothing. Okay, done with that rant. But I also want to say, finally, that there's no use in demonizing Brian Simmons either here. That's not what I'm trying to do. It's unlikely that anyone's going to go to hell because of his translation. They can still understand the gospel from it. They can still get a decent picture of Jesus from it. But at the end of the day, I would just advise people to avoid it. There's no reason to read it. And especially, don't pay money for it. A while back, I very respectfully reached out to Brian Simmons and to the publisher and asked for the following information because it's impossible to find on the web. So I asked him, where and under whom you studied Syriac slash Aramaic and for how long? What specific Syriac manuscripts, not English translations, you translate from? And if you have formally studied textual criticism, and if so, where and under whom? I don't know about you, but for someone who is doing a major translation, it seems like this kind of information should be easily available to the public. Now, I never received any kind of reply. My hunch is that there's no good answer to these questions. Mike Winger and others have discovered that his PhD was on prayer through the Wagner Leadership Institute, which is an institute deeply rooted in the new apostolic reformation. Although Brian Simmons denies publicly that he's associated with the New Apostolic Reformation, which is also referred to as NAR, he seems to have chosen to study at the university of its founder and is listed as a featured lecturer on the website. If you don't know about the Wagner Leadership Institute, it's not a standard seminary or Bible college that offers academic courses on the Bible and theology. Rather, it was founded to serve non-traditional courses that teach people about NAR and how to be apostles and prophets and work miracles. So to end all of this, let me read to you the opinion of Dr. Shedd, who is the head of Old Testament and Hebrew at Moore Theological College in Sydney and is a member of the NIV Committee on Bible Translation. He has some strong words to say in the conclusion of his article for the Gospel Coalition which I'll link in the description. I probably wouldn't go quite as far as he does, but he's worth listening to in any case.
The Passion Translation is not a Bible, and any church that treats it as such and receives it as canon will, by that very action, turn itself into an unorthodox sect. If the translation had been packaged as a commentary on Scripture, I would not have needed to write this review. But to package it as Scripture is an offense against God. Every believer who is taught to treat it as the inscripturated words of God is in spiritual danger, not least because of the sentimentalized portrait of God that the Passion Translation Psalms sets out to paint. This 500th anniversary of the Reformation is a time to remember how urgent and contested the question of Bible translation was back when almost no one in the world had the scriptures in their heart language. One of the accusations Catholic apologists brought against early Bible translators was that they added words to the text in support of their Protestant heresies, just as the Arians and Pelagians had done before them. All the Arians had to do was change one word in Proverbs 8.22. This was a dangerous charge, and William Folk's defense of 1583 is a good place to end this review. The original text of the Holy Scripture we alter not, either by adding, taking away, or changing of any letter or syllable for any private purpose, which were not only a thing most wicked and sacrilegious, but also vain and impossible. For so many ancient copies of the original text are extant in diverse places of the world that we should be rather mad than foolish if we did but once attempt such a matter for maintenance of our own opinions. Anyway, I hope this has been helpful. Working for the Word is a podcast where we believe that the Bible is a God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists to help us all treasure the Bible, go deeper into it, and become more like the man of Psalm 1.